a meeting. And my take on the meetings was every time we have a meeting, the ones that need to be here are not here. But they do, trust me, watch television. And the word gets out. So I had uh, a gentleman, Mr. Stewart, call me and he said, Mrs. Poplar, I can reach out to this young community because I deal with young people every day. And if you would just give me a chance to do my CD song that reaches out to the young people, I would wish that you would allow me and my family to try to touch this community. So I don't close any avenues when it comes to reaching out to this community to stop the violence in our community. We cannot close no doors, nor can we <clears throat> vacate any street that may be able to help stop the violence in the city of Flint. So I'm thinking Mr. Stewart, he's going to do his song, and if it doesn't touch the whole community, and if it touches one person to stop them from doing crime, then his job has been done this evening. So Mr. Stewart and your family, we welcome you and the floor is now yours. You 
got a chip was on site time, but now you got paper time, making life in the penitentiary. Stop the line in the killing. You want any man to go to the killer? Pop, 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 my head, my shit, making life in the penitentiary. Thank you for the check. Thank you for the check. Thank you for the check. Big Alex was saying, you out of sight, out of mind. You out of sight, out of mind when you lock up behind the walls. And the people you love start to forget about you. Your mama, your dad, your babies, and your girl. Out of sight, out of mind. I guess if you don't mind putting that trick on, you don't mind getting that sound to us. Try not to drop yourself. Try not to drop yourself. Cause if you do, you're through. Ha. Mr. Stewart, I want to thank you and your family for blessing us. And I want to really thank you for being the father that you are, manning up, raising your children, and keeping them on the right direction in life. And I can look at these, and I can tell 
They're doing well in life already. They're doing well in school. They're obedient. And they're dressing as we wish our young people would. So thank you so much for not only just blessing us at the city council meeting, but blessing this city. Because I know somebody got this message this evening that's going to watch this. I know the word will get out. So I just want to thank you so very, very much from all of us here at City Council. We thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you again so much. Next on the agenda is a special order um, to present to the City Council the audit of 2012. Um, we have Platt Moran and Jerry Ambrose from the City Finance Director um, here this evening to walk us through the um, through the audit and then after their presentation if council members have any questions we can um, pose the questions to the um, to the auditors thank you thank you mr. president good evening council members Jerry can you pull the mic down so that everybody yes. can hear you thank All righty. you better thank you mr. president good, good evening council members My name is Jerry Ambrose. I'm the finance director, and my purpose here tonight uh, is to uh, in introduce you uh, once again uh, to the uh, the auditors who have uh, spent a lot of time looking at the uh, city's uh, books for the fiscal year ended uh, June 30th of 2012. Uh, that was about uh, six months ago. Seems like a long time ago. Uh, but they've got some good information for you. Uh, for the public, I want to apologize. We've got some technical difficulties that, that will preclude us from uh, the presentation being shown on an overhead. Uh, I would say that the audit uh, is available online, the city's website, um, as is the uh, uh, emergency manager's first quarter report uh, for uh, December 31st, which also speaks to that audit. So. At that, and so I would encourage you all to look at those. And if you, again, if you have questions of us, be glad to respond uh, at, at, at other times. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, I'd like to introduce Ted Harburn and Amanda Kronk, Kronk of the uh, Plant Moran, who's been the city, uh, city's auditors for some time now. Uh, we're here last year when we were here. And so with that, I'll just turn it right over to you, Ted. Yep. Hello. Uh, we should have in front of you a uh, bound uh, graphical presentation that we're going to walk through. It gives you the highlights from the audit for last fiscal year. So on page one of that bound uh, presentation, you'll see um, in terms of the deliverables, deliverables for the audit, uh, there's the auditor's report letter for the comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, and we've uh, issued what's called a qual unqualified or clean opinion on the financial statements indicating that they're, they, they do um, basically uh, indicate the results of operations for the city for, and financial position for last fiscal year in accordance with general accepted accounting principles. So that's the highest level of assurance you can have on your financial statements that they're free from material misstatement. Uh, here again, the, the big comprehensive annual financial report, or it's called a CAFR, if you will. Those are representations of management here at the city, and we as auditors express an opinion on those. Uh, we also issued a report to the emergency financial manager, honorable mayor, and the city council dated de December 21st. We're going to cover the highlights uh, of that within this uh, presentation here tonight. There's also what's called a single audit or a financial and compliance audit of your federal programs. That is in process, uh, in the review process right now and anticipated that that will be issued no later than March 31st. And, and just to, so everyone knows what that is, those are HUD block grant dollars that the city receives. That's correct. Okay. The lion's share of it is, is HUD dollars, yes. Okay, um, page two. So uh, just defining some of the responsibilities for the audit firm, um, first of all, we issued 
an opinion on the financial statements that, that I just mentioned, and it's to provide reasonable but not absolute assurance that the financial statements are free from material misstatement. In other words, we don't look at 100% of the transactions that flow through this, the city's books. It's impossible for anyone to do that. But based on uh, a review of the controls that are in place, we do sampling and we, we look at uh, more material items than, than less significant uh, to come up with the uh, the disclosures within the financial statements. Also, in terms of internal controls, we understand what the major controls are over the city's finances and, and the major cycles that would be receivables, re receipts, receivables, payables, payroll, uh, and those types of things. Uh, in the, for the purpose of, of planning our audit, not necessarily to render an opinion on internal controls. However, if there's improvements that need to uh, that, that we identify during that uh, audit, we're required to report those to you in written form, which we have in that other letter that I mentioned and that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, then, of course, we perform the single audit, which we just mentioned here, uh, on the city's general com compliance with laws and regulations as they spend those federal dollars. And there's significant regulations that, you, that you're aware that, that the city has to follow. Uh, and then the last item is to try to plan the audit to um, determine if there's any fraud noted. And I'm happy to report that there's no communications of fraud that we need to, uh, to communicate to you tonight about. Um, there's no new accounting policies adopted last fiscal year. Uh, within the CAFR, or the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, there are various uh, estimates within the, the numbers themselves, some of those estimates are the claims payable, um, also re related law to lawsuits, also obligations rel related to your pension and other post-employment benefits, um, and also there's uh, some estimates with regard to the allowance for uncollectible receivables, and also an estimate of pending tax tribunal and county, county chargebacks, uh, and also the the value of any land held for resale. All of those ha are sensitive to certain adjustments and judgments, and so there are some estimates within your financial statements. Um, didn't have any difficulties performing the audit. We had full cooperation, and uh, the process went very smooth. Um, thank you to the finance and, and all the city departments, so we appreciate that. Um, there were some uh, corrected and uncorrected misstatements, in other words, audit adjustments, where we proposed identified some adjustments that needed to be made, which is not, not uncommon. We every, every year go through, and it's, for a city this size, it's un, not uncommon to have audit adjustments. Um, so we identify those, and we propose those to management, and they, they determine uh, to post those adjustments. There were a couple uncorrected adjustments, but they were immaterial. Okay, in terms of internal controls, uh, we did issue a report on internal control. There were fewer items, issues noted than in the previous year, so that is great. Uh, one of the material weaknesses that we noted was bank reconciliations were not performed timely during the year. However, at the time of the audit, all those bank recs were caught up to date. And so uh, management's putting a process in place to make sure that bank recs are done on a timely basis throughout the year. Uh, I did mention we identified some accrual adjustments, and so that in and of itself is, uh, depending on the size of the adjustments, are considered uh, material weaknesses. Uh, and, um, and management is, is moving forward to uh, help identify those in the future so that this comment can go away. Um, there was an adjustment related to uh, some of the grants, uh, and typically there's accruals of expenses and related reimbursements that get recorded. Uh, but typically there's a, a period of availability of when you record those uh, revenues as, um, as a part of the, the year end. Typically that's within the 90 day period. If, if you don't receive those reimbursements within 90 days, then those revenues get deferred. However, we noted that relative to some of those reimbursements in those categories, uh, the expenses were not rec accrued as well. And so um, there was an adjustment to pick up those accruals of those expenses and then defer the revenue on those grant receipts. Um, there were some uh, adjustments made to the water supply division capital asset activity. 
in terms of recording gains and losses on disposals and construction and progress. So those are the major uh, 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 reporting uh, issues and going forward we've had a, a good discussion with management and uh, they're, they're, they understand what the issues are and, and are putting processes in place to, to correct those items. Um, with that, we're going to cover a little bit of the, the numbers themselves from the, each of the, uh, from the, the major funds. And so, Amanda, why don't you uh, go ahead and walk through those. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Slide five depicts your general fund revenues and expenditures for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2012. I'd like to begin with your revenue sources, which will include your transfers into the general fund. Looking at the revenue compared to 2011, it did decrease significantly. There are two items that I would like to point out, which were one-time items that occurred during your 2011 fiscal year. Those would be $8 million of bond proceeds that the city received, along with approximately $8.3 million of revenue related to the judgment levy that was related to the Genesee Towers building. If you remove those two items from your 2011 revenue, which is presented on this slide, that would leave your 2011 revenue at about $61.9 million. If we compare that to your 2012 revenue, your 2012 revenue decreased approximately 7.3 or 12%. That decrease of 7.3 million is primarily attributable to $2 million decrease in your property tax revenue, a $3.3 million decrease in your state revenue, which is primarily made up of your state shared revenue, and 1.6 million decrease in your charge for service. Moving on to your expenses, again, we will take out the one-time impact of Genesee Towers. If you remove the Genesee Towers expense from both 2011 and 2012, that would leave your 2011 expenses at approximately 63.9 million in comparison to 2012, which would be approximately 64.9. So that would leave an increase in your expenses from 2011 to 2012 of approximately 912,000 or 1.4 percent. So if you remove Genesee Towers from both your revenue and expense, since it was a one-time accounting item, it makes the comparison a little more reasonable. This graph also has a line representation, which represents the fund balance in general fund from 2011 as compared to 2012. As you can see, general fund's deficit was 7.3 million in 2011. In 2012, it was 19.2 million. Moving on to the next slide, slide six. This is also a table related to general fund. This will show the city's amended budget as compared to the actual revenue and expenditures that occurred during the year. Looking at the first line, which represents your total revenue, the city's amended budget was higher than the actual by approximately 649,000. So that represents the actual revenue was under budget by approximately 1.2%. We, we've broken out the Genesee Towers market adjustment from your total expenses, just so you could see what the expenses did in comparison to the amended budget without Genesee Towers in there. Looking at all your other expenditures for the year in comparison to the amended budget, the city was over budget by 0.6% or 388,000, not including general fund. The city's total expenditures were over budget by approximately 3.2%, including Genesee Towers. We'd also like to point out that the city's amended budget budgeted to increase the deficit by approximately 7.6 7 million before, before, that's before transfers. After transfers, it was approximately 9 million. So 
Actually, the city increased the deficit by 11.9 as compared to the 9 million after transfers. Slide seven shows your water supply division and your sewage disposal division, 2011 fiscal year in comparison to 2012 fiscal year. The first line represents the operating revenue of those two systems. The water supply division saw a 22% increase in its revenue. The sewage disposal division saw a 31.6% increase in its revenue. Those two items are prim primarily results of fee increases to the residents. The next line down shows your operating expenses. We've broken out depreciation expense for your benefit since it really is a non-cash item. We wanted to show what the expenses incurred for those funds were. In the water supply division, the expenses other than depreciation decreased 2.9%. The sewage disposal division saw a decrease in those expenses of 18.3%. Again, depreciation expense is a non-cash item, so we broke that out for you. Leaving the operating income or loss for those funds at 2012 is three million in the water supply division, and the sewage disposal division at a loss of 2.1 million. Now, I would like to point out that the operating income represents the funds that were brought into those systems by, by charging the residents and backing out the expenses related to funding those systems. I would also like to point out that both operating income in the sewer, sewage disposal division along with the water supply division increased from 2011. So 2011 saw a $4.8 million loss in the water supply division compared to the income this year. The sewage disposal division saw a $12.3 million loss as compared to the $2.1 million loss this year. So the, those are both great trends to see in your water and sewer divisions. Continuing down, there's a few um, non-operating items that we've presented for your benefit. I'd like to look at the change in net assets line. So this is also following a similar suit as your operating income. So both of the divisions saw great increases in this line item. You're ending unrestricted deficit in these funds, which represents <coughs> funds that are available to be used and are not restricted for any particular purpose. In the water supply division, the deficit was reduced by 3.7 million or 30% during fiscal year 12. The sewage disposal division was in a deficit in 2011 and is now out of that deficit at 300,000 of unrestricted <coughs> net assets at the end of 2012. Moving on to slide eight. Slide eight depicts your other post-employment benefit liability or your OPEB liability. So while the OPEB liability remains to be a large obligation of the city, there was significant improvement in that liability from prior year based on negotiations and employee concessions. So as of six, June 30th, 2011, the liability was approximately 862 million. At the end of fiscal year 2012, that liability was 367 million approximately, which is a decrease of $495 million. Slide nine shows your funds that were in deficit as of 6-30-12. Those funds are general fund and the water supply division fund. We just wanted to point out that um, management and the finance department are working on completing the appropriate deficit elimination plan for those funds. There's also, those are the, the funds within the, 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 the uh, primary government. There's also the EDC that also has a small deficit which needs to have a deficit plan as well and I, I believe the EDC itself is going to be coming up with that plan as well. Moving on to slide 10. This slide shows a few other recommendations that we had as a result of the audit. 
The first item relates to the pooled cash. This, the table presented shows the ongoing trend analysis of the pooled cash and the related fund, um, the related general fund deficit in the pooled cash. Going forward, we encourage the city to continue reviewing the pooled cash and the funds in deficit during the budget process. The second bullet on this slide shows the internal service funds. We, as a result of the audit, uh, have a recommendation regarding the internal service funds. Over the past few years, those funds, which would include your self-insurance fund, um, your data processing fund, and your fringe fund, and the maintenance garage fund, have accumulated net assets as a result of charging the other funds of the city. The city, those net assets have been accumulating. The, the city and management is working on reducing the level of those net assets through their cost allocation plan, which is being looked at. But it should be pointed out that those funds currently do not have cash. They're, they're basically due to's, due from's, but still, in terms of charging amounts to the other funds, um, they're going to be reduced through the cost, through adjustments in the cost allocation plan. The last slide, slide 11, shows a few things about the single audit and the status. As Tad mentioned, the report is expected to be issued by March 31st. Testing has been performed on five major programs, which equates to approximately 85% of the federal funding that, this, that the city has received during the year. A few details on your federal expenditures. Your total federal expenditures for the year were approximately 22 million in comparison to your um, Recovery Act dollars that were received, 13 million of those dollars were spent during the year. That's the, the funds that we wanted to cover at this point. Are there any questions that we can help you with at this point? Okay, let me um, ask council members <clears throat> if they have any questions. Um, any questions by council members? I have, I have a question. I'll start with Councilman Lawler. At the, uh, the current, you said there was an increase of 11.9 in the deficit for the water and sewer. Uh, at the current water and sewer rate that we have in place here, do you project um, us coming in the black within the next year? Uh, just a kind of a point of clarification, the, the deficit in general fund increased 11.9. The actual uh, deficit for the sewer and water funds uh, our list are shown on slide seven. And so there was improvements made in both of those funds. Um, at the end of 2012, the water supply deficit was 8.7 million. It was previously the year before 12.4. So if that trend continues, it would take uh, roughly two and a half years to eliminate that deficit just looking at roughly reducing that by f uh, five million a year. So it might, be, might take a year and a half to two years before that's eliminated, if that trend continues. The sewer fund at this point in time is out of a deficit. So, uh, you know, it's important that you continue to uh, mm -hmm. develop a, uh, a capital reserve so that you can address any repairs and maintenance to that system uh, because it is an older system. And so even though you're out of the deficit, you still need to be aware of cash needs for that, for that system. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilman Neely. Yes, thank you, Councilman Kincaid. Uh, thank you, Amanda, for that report. Um, Council President Kincaid, uh, for the Residents' perspective, uh, would it be okay if we give this to Paul Hearing so he can also place this uh, with the video presentation to the public so they can actually follow the presentation? I know it's kind of hard to follow even when you have the book in front of you. And I know the public, uh, they don't have uh, the slides there, but 
for yes. the purpose of the broadcast. Yes, I we can do that. All right, that'd be great. An extra copy uh, to yep, and we'll have copies for the public too. All right, thank you. Amanda, um, we use some, some terms in these slide presentations. Uh, could you talk about the unrestricted, unrestricted funds that we talked about the water and sewer on slide seven? Could you quick go ahead and give a brief uh, definition for the public's perspective so they can have a clear understanding? Well, the unrestricted uh, net assets, and I'll, I'll take, take the question, uh, basically are in the sewer and water fund, you have, uh, you can have restricted resources, which typically are, if you have bond, revenue bonds, you typically have to have reserves available to pay those revenue bonds, the next revenue bond payment. Um, and then everything else would be unre unrestricted. Um, it, after backing out capital assets. So part of the equity of those funds, sewer and water funds, is the lines in the system and the ground. From an accounting standpoint, you earmark those that are unavailable to spend, you back out any restricted resources, and the remaining part is, is unrestricted uh, net assets, which is somewhat similar to fund balance in general fund. It's more liquid than, than, uh, than spending lines in the ground. So hopefully that provides some perspective of the sewer and water funds because that fund being on a full accrual basis, you've got fixed assets in there and you have to back out the effects of those fixed assets to get down to the unrestricted portion. Okay. Right. And Ted, uh, the reason I ask that question because people of this community have a, very, they have a lot of concerns about the water issues and the increases in water. And so when we talk about the breakdown of the funding aspect, I think that's very important to elaborate on that for those residents that have concerns. But when you talk about the unrestricted portions, portions of the payment that goes in for water payments, you know, um, uh, Mrs. Smith comes in and makes a payment for her water bill, and some of it goes for water, and other goes for service, and others end up in unrestricted categories. Uh, by and large, and let me, let me get to the uh, fund itself in this, in this financial statement uh, so I can refresh my memory. But typically, your user fees go towards paying the costs of, of providing that service to the residents. And if there's a debt service portion, then that would go towards paying bonds. So in, in your case, In your case, there are some revenue bonds related to the water, water system. So some portion of your user fees go, have to go towards paying those bonds. In the sewer fund, um, you do not have bonds. And so the lion's share of those user fees go towards operations or also providing a capital reserve, a cash capital reserve for future repairs and maintenance on the system. So typically, the inflows are the user fees. That's typically all you get from, from the residents are the user fees. And then they go towards providing that service to the residents, the operations, cost of providing that service. And then possibly in the water fund, uh, it goes towards paying debt. A portion of that goes to pay debt. And then the third category would be to provide some type of capital reserve for future repairs and maintenance. Okay. And all three of those costs are, are valid costs of the system. In, in the case of the water system, you have bonds that you have to pay off. The sewer system, you do not at this point. So that's good. You don't have a debt service element in, in the sewer fund. All right. Thank you, Ted. Okay. okay. Any other questions? I, I just have a couple. On, on page six of the outline book here. It, the amended budget that was adopted by the City Council um, on June 5th was 52-147-042. That's general fund. And the actual revenue that came in for that fiscal year was 51-497, correct? 
So that's a difference of $649,000 in a budget that was adopted by the City Council based on our revenue projections for the year and what the actual revenue came in. There was a difference of $649,000. During the course of that fiscal year, was there ever any budget amendments during that time of July 1 to June 30th of 2012? The, in the general fund? The general fund amended budget um, is the final amended budget for that fiscal year. So um, maybe Jerry has a, a better perspective on. So I would just say generally the figures in this presentation refer, reflect the amended budget and there was a budget amendment that had been done by the emergency manager. So the figures that are here are not the adopted council budget. These are not the adopted numbers? They are not. Do you know what that amendment in the general fund was? Was it five or six million dollars? The, uh, in your I didn't, I didn't bring my budget book for okay. the year. In, in, do you have your CAFR? The CAFR? The big book? The big book. Yeah, I have the CAFR book. Okay. Turn to 90, page 93. Were there any other amendments between this and that? Okay. 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 So 93 shows the general fund budget to actual, and it shows the original budget adopted, and then the final amended budget. So you'll see the revenues at the top, originally at 46 million, were amended to 52.1 million, and then all the way down to the bottom of that page, you'll see the, on the expenses, adopted at 49.8 million, and amended at 59.7 million. So that shows you the differences between the, the first original budget amendment, uh, adopted and the last amended budget. And the numbers that were adopted were the 49,858. Yes, on expenses side, yeah. That's what the city council adopted. Yes. And the actual revenue that came in was 51,497. Correct. So that's 1.9 million difference. Basically. Uh, a little, um, let's see. Well, between between which numbers? Well, it ends up in a deficit of 1.9. Right. The, the difference between yeah, the difference between the amended budget and the actual. So that last column is is comparing the final amended budget with the actual at, uh, revenues and expenses that occurred. Okay. All right. I'm just trying to reflect on what we adopted as, as a city council, yep. and then what amendments took place during the fiscal year to get us to a $19 million deficit at the end of June 30th, 2012. Yeah, the, the original budget, uh, which is that first column, and it continues on to page 94. Um, uh, anticipated uh, dipping in or increasing the deficit by 474,000. Um, because we, when we adopt our budget, we, we adopt it based on projected revenue. Yeah. Information that we get from Plant Moran for the most part, and the administration. Yeah. Right? The past practice, yeah. Yep. Right. And so when we adopted our budget of $46 million, the actual revenue came in less. The actual revenue came in more. The actual revenue is $51.4 million. Okay. So. Yeah. You know, property tax, you can just compare. Property taxes were down co compared to the, the budgets. Uh, income tax revenue um, was a little bit higher. Uh, licenses and permits are about the same as what you adopted. Federal grants, um, or your original budget, you didn't budget for federal grants. That, that actually had 1.4 million. 
State shared revenues uh, originally estimated at 9.3, but it came in at 13.4, so that was a, the largest share of the increase in, in the actual revenues. Um, and then the other resources are pretty consistent except this local revenue. I'm not really, I don't recall what, what's included in that, but that, that gives you the difference between the original projected revenue and, and, and what, actually, what actually happened at the end of the year, yeah. And then um, in the CAFR book, if you go all the way to the back on page eight, there's a finding in there um, on the financial statement where the city borrowed um, as part of the pooled cash a uh, million fifty nine from local streets. Does that money have to be put back into the 202 and 203 fund? Uh, from a pooled cash standpoint, the state would say yes, that has to be, that has to be restored. Now at what point in time, you know, I'm sure part of the deficit reduction plan that will be part of it will be to try to restore cash, pooled cash for the city as a whole, and then that, those two funds, cash accounts, can be replenished. Right now there's a do to, do from situation. Uh, and typically the, the state has said, well, Act 51 dollars are restricted and you really shouldn't be using that f uh, as a cash management tool. You have to keep those funds intact. And so at some point they would have to be restored, yes. Okay. But that will have to be a part of the deficit reduction plan. I would anticipate it. That would probably would. be over a five-year period or whatever. Correct. Okay. Okay. And then I have one last question, and it's to the Genesee Towers. I don't ever recall um, a, re a reflection in the in the audit of a deficit for a facility that would be a net asset to the city. And how, how did that come about when the taxpayers paid for that facility based on the court judgment? I'm not sure, was it because the property was valued at 1.5 million 40, and we sold it for 1.5 million 39. Is that Basically, what yeah, it's created it's a, the 1.5 million or 1.4 million dollar deficit. Uh, well, over a two-year period, it, the the effect of the Genesee Towers is zero because basically, last year, a portion of the payment for that building had to be set up as an asset land held for resale. Mm -hmm. And so that came on your, on your balance sheet as an asset uh, based on an estimated value at that point in time. Roll forward to 2012. So there was, a, there was an artificial increase in your fund balance for th that asset last okay. year. Okay. Roll forward to 2012, it's finally determined that that asset was going to be sold for a dollar, and so that $1.5 million estimated value uh, is really needs to be written down to, to one dollar. And so over a two-year period, the, the, the effect on your fund balance is, is, is zero, because it artificially in, in 2011, from accounting rules, had to be added as an asset. In 2012, it had to be written off to zero. And the reason I ask that, not just specific to Genesee Towers, but in the broader sense of our net assets that we have in the city, and a lot of them we have a pilot program in place, uh, payment in lieu of taxes for facilities that we own that aren't actually assessed other than some sort of value put on it through the pilot. Um, and, and what I'm getting at is, and I'm just using this as an example, this isn't something that's in the works that I'm aware of or, or anything like that. But if the city were to sell the sewer plant and we were to sell it for $2, now I'm not saying that we are, mm -hmm. do we base the deficit on the value of that building by the pilot or how would we get what that asset value would be worth because it's a city owned facility? Well, any number that's in <clears throat> any number uh, asset that you have on your books, with regard to like the sewer fund or the water fund, 
we're dealing with historical costs. And historical costs do not necessarily uh, indicate the market value or of a third party buying that system. So you would have to get some type of third party appraisal of that particular asset to give you an under, you know, a feeling for how much a willing buyer would buy that, that asset for. Okay. You really can't go to the audited numbers because those are really just historical, uh, historical costs that you've invested in that over the years. And over the, you know, depreciation basically allocates that, that investment over the life of that system. But it, it's only an accounting mechanism. It's not necessarily to give you the fair value of that asset. And, and the reason I ask that is when the city owned the sports arena and we sold it, I went back and looked and I don't ever, I didn't see where we showed the deficit uh, when we sold the sports arena. So we must have sold it for more than what the value was at that time. Would, you'd have to go back and look, but I would, I would anticipate yes. I mean, if we sold it for less than what the value or the appraised value was, we would have to have right. created a deficit for that facility or in that fund. A, in, from, a, from a cash flow standpoint, you know, if, if there was a deficit there, you would have had to transfer dollars from someplace to make that fund whole zero. Right. So I would assume that uh, based on your, your analysis. And if that was a general fund owned facility like the IMA Sports or like the uh, Tennessee Towers, then that would have re reflected in the general fund. Correct. Uh, I Where believe the sewer plant would reflect in the sewer fund. That's right. And I believe the sports system was, uh, the, the IMA Ice Arena was a enterprise fund. It was an enterprise fund. So that's outside of general fund. And that, that fund held that asset. And then when you sold it, uh, you, you would have reflected whatever gain or loss on that. But the general fund always subsidized the enterprise fund because it operated in a deficit. So those Operating would have been, transfers each those year. Those would have been general fund dollars that would have had to have been given back. Right. Okay. And just to summarize everything, what is the amount in the pooled cash as of June 30th, 2012? 10 million. I uh, didn't. Well, that's the deficit. That's the deficit. I'm, the pooled cash? <clears throat> pooled cash balance was a negative, or no, 13.4 million. Yes. 13.4 million. General Fund's pooled cash deficit was a 10.5 million. So the positive pool is 13.5 million. So we have 13.5 million in? In pooled cash as of June 30th. As of June 30th. Right. I'm not sure what it is at this point. Uh, it's gone up. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. That's all I have. Councilman Freeman? Just I guess quickly, and maybe Mr. Ambrose would be better to um, answer this. Uh, moving forward, we know where we are. Um, we know what those numbers are at the end of last budget year. Uh, what is the plan moving forward um, to deal with this deficit that we're in? Okay, thank um, you. Is there a deadline at the state that we have to have something, that you all have to have something into them to, that will show how right. you're going to deal with this deficit? And have you started to, to formulate this plan yet? We are, we are working on that as you speak, and we would expect that within the next 30 days we will be in a position to file the required deficit elimination plan with the state. The bottom line in that is, the, is a requirement that we show to the state that within the next five years we can eliminate that deficit. And so we're, we're working through that, and again, like I said, within the next 30 days I think we will uh, be addressing that. I would like to take it one step further, you know, and, and remembering that, that this financial report now was almost seven months ago. And it does not reflect uh, the pain that everyone went through, both in terms of reducing expenses and raising revenues uh, that were necessary to, for us to arrive at an, a balanced budget for FY13. And we are halfway through that year. And I would just say that generally right now, uh, as of six months into this year, our revenues and expenses are on target. And that means as we continue on in this budget year, we fully expect by the time we get to June 30th of 2013 that we will not have spent more than we have taken in. And I think that's in comparison to the way that FY12 ended and FY10 before that. Um, I think that's good, that's, that's a very positive sign. 
I would also say that our cash position has improved. Um, and that too is to our benefit. In both of those cases, though, I would say that's, uh, it would be a low bar to just say that things are better because we've now improved things. We still have, we, we still should be carrying a lot more cash. We have to uh, work to eliminate the $10 million uh, negative cash basically in the general fund, which coincidentally is not too far off from $11.1 .1 million. Um, so we will be working on that. We will be, and, and again, filing a, uh, a deficit elimination plan with the state. But on a going forward basis, based on this year, today, six months into this year, uh, we are operating on a balanced budget. Uh, we believe that, that the uh, uh, revenues are coming in generally as we have f forecast in the budget uh, that we're operating under and expenses are tracking uh, at about that level too. Of course, as in anything, you know, we may be a little high in one area and a little low in another, but on balance, that's our judgment that we are on track this year. And that's six months, almost seven months now after the close of the fiscal year that we're discussing right now. So, so to deal with that $19 million or 19 point whatever it is over the next five years and then taking into account that you know our revenue is going to continue to decline and that we're going to have to continue to make cuts, I mean, are we getting to a point where um, we're collecting taxes to pay for retirees or are we getting to a point where we continue to offer services? Because, I mean, I don't, I don't see where you know, with our revenue continuing to decline, how do we deal with that $19 million deficit and stay in a positive, you know, budget-wise, stay in a positive uh, number there without continuing to add to that 19, I, knowing I what we've got to deal with? I agree with you. I think that, that we believe there is a, continues to be a significant challenge in managing the financial affairs of the city of Flint. And that uh, over the next few years, uh, will we get to it? I believe it's fully possible that we can manage the expenses to the revenues that we are able to, uh, to, get, to gather. Whether at the end of that time when we have done that, we have a city that is, that is sufficiently viable. And I, and I mean that city government in the sense of, you know, does that leave us enough money to actually hire enough people to do even the most basic of city services? I think that's the challenge that we all have before us right now. I think we've shown this year to date uh, that we are able to construct and operate in a budget that's balanced. We know that we have a deficit to eliminate and we know that we have the challenges that you've pointed out about moving forward when revenues are declining. Uh, but I also think there are some things that we've been working on to do structurally that, that we hope, you know, anticipate will, will uh, be positive in that sense. For example, and, and it was mentioned in the auditor's report, uh, the significant decrease in the accumulated uh, unfunded liability for retiree health care. Now that's a big, that's $900 million and it drops to 400 and boy that's great, but that seems like a, those, those are numbers, that sounds like the federal deficit at that, that level. But let's translate it to what the, uh, what the valuation experts were saying we should, a year ago, should have been setting aside to pay for retiree health care. They said at that time you should be setting aside $60 million a year to cover retiree health care. That's bigger than the general fund. Um, but now, with the changes that we've made, they now say you need to be sending, setting aside $22 million. Um, and that includes not only what we should set aside, but what it costs us to pay retiree health care right now. That is a significant adjustment. Now, on the other hand, it is still almost half of the city's general fund, if you look at it in that, in that way. So it's still very significant, but we've made significant progress. Uh, we've made changes in our, in our pension systems. Um, we are still waiting for the valuations on that, so we've got you know, fine uh, detailed figures to give you, but we believe uh, that there are, that we have been able, will have been able to con constrain the growth in the pension liabilities to, to a significant extent. Uh, those are long-term things that, that will help us in the future. We've made other changes, and again, working, and, and, and now we are still waiting for the valuations on that, so we've got, you know, fine uh, detailed figures to give you, but we believe uh, that there are, that we have been able, will have been able to Con constrain the growth in the pension liabilities to, to a significant extent. Uh, those are long-term things that, that will help us in the future. 
we've made other changes, and again, working and, and, and not without pain. You know, as we, we know, residents and businesses are paying more, employees are getting less, and they have different benefits. Um, but those things do have benefits, positive uh, benefits for the future as we, as we deal with this challenge before that. So I, all I can tell you is I understand. I think we have an unanswered question about at the level, you know, at what level of services can we provide, can the city government provide to its residents and businesses in the next three, four, five years? And is that going to be so small that it's really not viable? We don't know that answer yet. Uh, we're working and, and, and optimistic that the, the answer will be yes, we can. To, to your point, Jerry, on, on retiree health care, I know we've had a, a large significant savings due to some things that have been implemented. Yes. Do you foresee those same savings in this budget year, or are we kind of at the point now where we've, we've achieved those savings based on the things that we've implemented, and that if health care continues to rise, that that number, instead of going down, is going to start going back up again? I, I, would, mean, like, I would like to say that I would believe retiree, you know, I, I the mean, cost of health care will go down, but that's not correct. Right. I mean, okay, yes. I think we achieved some significant savings. We've reduced costs, but even at the lower level, we're still going to be subject to the inflationary increases that are associated with health care. And, and we're going to have to continue to look at that. We're going to have to look at health care, pension, compensation, you know, energy, um, all the things that run this city. And we're going to have to continue to look uh, at every one of them and, and, and try to figure out, can we be more efficient? Are there different ways that this city can organize so they can still deliver services? Okay, Jackie. I wasn't done. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilman Freeman. Back to the back to the deficit that we have now. Can you give us some insight as to what that plan to pay that off may look like? If you're saying that our budget this year is, you know, even with you know, our expenditures or even with revenues, how do we have anything to set aside to pay off? You know, to set something aside this year, let alone over the next five years to pay something towards that. Those are those are good questions. Um, the deficit plan that we that was. Uh, submitted to the state last year uh, and approved uh, ultimately by the state had taken the position that uh, it would be very difficult within the constraints of the city to figure out how to take money, you know, much money out of operating expenses and apply that to eliminate a deficit. And the, the conclusion there was that we should probably borrow. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at that again, uh, but we're also looking at the size of the accumulated deficit and whether that, whether that amount of money can, can or should be borrowed or whether we're just going to have to make other you know, choices about reducing expenses so we can set money, money aside. Um, in, in, in one way, it's, I mean, there are the, the options, other than getting a check from the state or from someone else to eliminate the deficit, we really have relatively few choices. We've got to find more money or we've got to reduce expenses. Um, you know, if we, even if we were to borrow, I mean, of course, borrowing doesn't come free. We still incur the debt service. So I don't know the answer to that right now. It, it may be a mix of, of borrowing. It may be a mix of, I mean, it may be a mix of borrowing versus uh, figuring out how to incorporate into our spending plan for the next several years uh, a, a buy down on the deficit. Just two more questions. Do we have the capacity to borrow that full amount? I have. I don't know that answer. I think that we it would be it would exceed the amount that could be secured by a revenue sharing pledge. Okay. And the second question I had is: Is five years the max that the state will allow us to deal with this, or through a deficit elimination plan, or is there a longer term um, option? I will let you know as we talk with the state about it. Uh, they, basically, that's the rule. That's been the. The, uh, you know, I mean, we have to submit a deficit elimination plan. We are told that the, the requirement is it has to be eliminated within five years. Maybe you know better than I do. I don't know whether that's statute or I believe it is statute. Um, but we will certainly be talking with Treasury. I mean, they have, you know, they have an interest in, in the city succeeding financially, too. And if they were to agree with us that it's not doable, we'd look for other options. But right now, I think that's the rule. That's the challenge we have is a plan that can, that, 
can address this deficit within five years. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Councilwoman Poplar. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Just a couple of questions. Uh, Jerry, do you foresee um, in the projected future selling um, any more of the city assets? And would you sell them at market value instead of one dollar? Well, I would, I would say, I mean, I hate to use the old phrase, everything is on the table. We certainly are going to look at city assets along with everything else and, and make what we would consider to be reasoned judgments. Do we have a plan right now that says we, we've got city assets to sell? No. Well, I'm hoping that when you do make that decision and whatever you come to on city assets, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that the city is cash strapped and selling our assets for one dollar makes no sense to me. But who am I but the second ward city council person? But I, I, I just don't see the reasoning behind it. And as you sit down at the table that we don't sit down to, I would hopefully hope that you will sell assets at the market value. My second question. The Citizen Service Bureau, the lawsuit, which was $4.5 million, yes. has that been paid and what fund did it come out of? Have we met our obligations to make the Have payments? you met your obligations? We have. And yeah, that money was set aside, that money was set aside in the, uh, if I remember correctly, it was in the, uh, our self-insurance fund. And that actually had been booked as a liability, as a payable, uh, last year. So you did have that money in the self-insurance fund? That money had been set aside pursuant to, you know, accounting rules uh, because it was a liability that the city had that was payable. So we had no choice but to book it as a liability. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Sargent, sir. Um, have you had any, any discussions with the state with regard to the self-insurance program and what they think of that uh, program, and is uh, I don't know, that is that a common practice among amongst uh, municipalities to self-insure? Okay. Well, let me say that that uh, I wasn't here, so I don't know the facts behind it all. What I am told is that the experience that the city of Flint had due to numbers of lawsuits in prior years made it virtually impossible for the city to, to, to obtain any sub significant insurance coverage. The insurance coverage we have now is minimal. Um, we will, in, in the world of all the things that are on lists to look at, we are going to be evaluating again uh, the extent to which the city of Flint may be insurable. And and uh, and equating that, you know, of course, the premium against yeah, the Yeah, I didn't realize that that, that was, yeah. Okay, because okay, I, I, I would think that would be a point for them. Why are they self-insuring, or is this a good thing, or? Right. I would think they would be interested. Okay, any other questions? Councilman Lawler. Yes, um, you said we currently have um, a balanced budget for the operations of the city right now. We do. We currently have a balanced budget, and we have a deficit of 19.1 mil. Right. Um, borrowing may be an option. Uh, has the um, administration considered um, putting forth a uh, city income tax increase to help balance the budget and to keep us in a surplus in the black? We have uh, had many discussions about that. Mm -hmm. I believe that uh, when we look at the options that are available to the city in terms of raising revenues, significant amounts of revenues, uh, we believe that the income tax is an alternative which we should pursue. Unfortunately, it is not within our prerogative to do so unilaterally. Uh, it would require the state legis the legislature to uh, change the laws that would, it would uh, uh, 
then enable us to place that as a question to the voters. Sure. It certainly is something we have been aware of, we have been talking about, uh, and, and, and frankly, when we look at the choices that we have about significant increases in revenues, um, changing the uh, rate of income tax collection is one of those things. So you've talked about it, but there's been, there's been no actions taken on moving forward with well, moving making forward, that proposal. Well, you know, I, I haven't personally been involved in it. I know there have been conversations with state legislators. I mean, the, in order to get this through the state legislature, you've got to have somebody uh, who will support it. You've got to have a majority of the legislature vote for it. We've been exploring those options. You know, you, we did have a, over the last, uh, you know, 60 days, you've had one legislature end and another one come in. You've got folks, and you have a number of things going on. Uh, frankly, it hasn't been a top item of priority uh, at the state level, uh, but it is something that, that we have engaged the folks that we think that, that we need to be talking to, to to see what the possibilities are. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilman Neely? Yeah. Jerry, I know the, the purpose of this special uh, special order was to present the audit to us, but since you went into the area of some type of forecasting uh, for the city, have we engaged in uh, any other type of trying to generate revenue for the city? Because my philosophy is that we can't cut our way out of a deficit. We have to generate additional revenue. Any, any way that we can addi uh, generate additional revenue without taxation, uh, have we engaged in any activities? Raising revenues without taxation, I'm not sure how you do that. Well, cost recovery type of programs, you, you know. Yes. Uh, well, I would say at this point, um, we are engaged in, in um, monitoring our activities with regards to collections that are currently anticipated in the budget, trying to improve those things, trying to improve, for example, the collection rate uh, of income tax. Um, you know, we do have folks that we believe that there are folks that uh, uh, perhaps live in the city of Flint, but don't file and file a state income tax uh, form, but don't get around to filing the local income tax form. We're evaluating that. Uh, we did institute a number of fee increases, uh, including cost recovery. Uh, we are walking through, learning as we go through it, what works, what doesn't work, how to improve it. So I think we're focused on, on, on the things we have on our plate right now, but we're also now beginning to think you know, this being January, beginning to think about the, the financial plan that will go into place in July. And I think we are, we are going to be as challenged next year as we were this year in terms of, of maintaining financial solvency. And we've got to look at both, you know, our choices about raising funds as well as becoming more efficient and reducing expenses. Uh, frankly, we're, just, we're going to have to look at all of it. Yeah. Well, I'm a firm proponent of, of everybody paying their fair share so it can ease the burden on those who are paying. So if we are looking at uh, ways that we can collect um, the monies from those individuals who are not paying their fair share, I, I will look at that, and as well as some of the abated areas of the city of Flint for businesses making sure that they pay their fair share as well. I would put those before you as an offer of, of trying to generate some additional um, income for this community where everybody pays their fair share or and or have their fair share of suffering as we go through this process uh, moving forward. But cost recovery programs, I think uh, some of the things that you have engaged in, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how, how that's working and, uh, and how much income we are generating in those areas as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much Thank for you. Um, bringing us the audit tonight and answering our questions. We really appreciate it. <clears throat> okay, before I um, move on, I'd like to um, recognize the um, Urban Context class from the University of Michigan that's here tonight. Would you all stand so we can recognize you for coming to our council meeting tonight? Thank you for coming tonight.
Okay, are there any petitions or unofficial communications, Madam Clerk? No, Mr. President. Are there any additional communications from other city officials, Madam Clerk? No, not at this time. Okay, this is a time set aside for members of the audit. We don't have any appointments either, do we? Uh, they'll come uh, under the resolutions. Okay, okay. This is a time set aside for members of the audience to address the city council. Uh, the clerk will call your name. Uh, please come to the microphone. We'll get it set back up here in a second. And give us your name uh, for the record and uh, limit your comments to five minutes and refrain from any personal attacks on individuals or institutions. And I'm not going to walk through all the rules. We've, we've done them a number of times. And um, so, first to be called this evening, Madam Clerk. Our first speaker is uh, Eric Mays. Mr. Mays, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I thought that was an interesting special order dealing with the audit, but I noticed, um, Scott, that you recognized the group who was here, and that's nice. It's good to see that group, but the group that I was hoping that you would recognize was sitting far in the back. It was, <laughs> it was the emergency manager form emergency manager. You had Ed Kurtz, Mike Brown, and Jason Lorenz, and, and another staff person. I would have been curious to see if you had offered the emergency manager an opportunity to respond to anything in front of us in this council meeting. This is the first council meeting. I've noticed them in the room. So I was hoping that they would stay, and then maybe I would have asked them you know, could the public hear from them. So whenever they're in the room, I would like to see if you can give them an opportunity to be recognized and communicate and dialogue in the public arena. That's a rare occasion from where I sit. And it's just a request from a citizen in the middle of this form of government. That's something that I would like to see. The audit and the numbers don't surprise me. If you bring in an emergency manager or managers and they are to fix a financial emergency, and I'm talking to the public, and they're making 100000 a year and they're making money to fix a deficit, it's like they're not trying to do it real fast because you'll work yourself out of a job. Remember that. I want Flynn and everybody around the state to remember. If I'm an emergency manager and my job is contingent upon a deficit, then the minute the deficit turns into a surplus, I'm gone. So if I'm a financial genius, and I come into a city with an $8 million deficit, and then a year or so later the deficit is $19 million. And then the next year I tell you, we are about where we need to be. I'm slow rolling myself. I'm not going to work myself out of a job. I'm here to tell the city of Flint and the council people, I got friends, believe me, who've got 19, 12, and 20 million. 12 million and 19 million dollars for a city, that ain't a lot of money. The My Foundation got millions. The federal government got millions. The state revenue sharing, as well as the state income tax increases millions. I asked Mr. Kurtz today, I said under Public Act 72, because remember we repealed Public Act 4, the city council's hands ain't as tied as they used to be before we repealed Public Act 4. The city council is free to meet. I asked him, I said, Mr. Kurtz, since you're here, I said, if they don't, I said, can't they have committee meetings?
Can't they talk and do business for three, four, five hours? Can't the city council meet in public and dialogue with us? Can't y'all give us special orders to talk about public safety just like you do plant Moran? You ain't got nothing else to do financially. He said, yeah, they can do whatever except for deal with finances. I've stood up here three, four weeks in a row and encouraged y'all to meet. You got to meet. We're in an emergency. You can't just meet every two weeks and listen to us and then the bell go off and we gone. And then at the end of the meeting, any council person got something to say and then y'all gone. We should be having forums on public safety in this chambers. We should be helping y'all do revenue things in this chambers. All of the meetings should be in this chambers. It should be some political leadership and movement from this council. Petitions come out tomorrow. Scott, you've chaired these meetings well for us citizens of the public. You've told us when the bell went off to sum up. I appreciate that. And I will sum up. I looked at the Flint Journal last week. I seen a part in there about the appointees and the new way we learned from Barnett Jones that the state now is going to do what city council used to do, approve the appointees, check and balance. I heard Pakel and read his plan. I'm against Pakel taking over the city police department. The city must have its own police and the county must do its thing. One key aspect of Pakel's plan, though, it talked about some plain clothes police. The number is off. I think he said six of them. We propose about 20. My point is this. Scott, last time we was here, Lawler almost made a motion. You set up a committee dealing with public safety. My belief is jobs, not jails. Jobs, not jails. Jobs, not police. But since you're talking police, and since you're talking public safety, because economic development and police go hand in hand, I went to the ceasefire thing at DuPont. That ain't what it should be, because no public input, no dialogue. The forum that he proposed needs to happen. And I bet you Josh can tell you, and some more people can tell you, if the city of Flint don't capitalize on the hiring that's going on in the police department right now, they're going to miss an opportunity to be proactive and save lives. My information tells me the people that's being hired, they don't look like the people on the North End. Right. It's going to be hard for white folks to catch black folks. So guess what? I'm going to sum up by saying Thanks, sir. You, better, you better pay close attention to the hiring we that's are. going on in the police department if you're going to be proactive about saving lives on the north end. We are. God bless. Thank you. Just, um, Eric, to your point while you're taking your seat, uh, we asked the administration, the emergency manager, about uh, doing a Academy here in Flint. So just just want you to know we suggested that they do an academy instead of hiring certified officers that don't reflect the demographics of our community. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is Chris Del Moroni. Chris Del Moroni. Thank you. My name is Chris Del Moroni, and I live in Flint, Michigan. Um, our, our city is at a real crossroads. We're not at a fork in the road. We're at a crossroads. And um, we've heard this evening about a potential income tax increase to the residents of Flint that some council people and others 
who may be in support of. Uh, I will say I am definitely against an income tax increase for the residents of Flint. And I, I say that because for the most part, the residents of Flint cannot afford it. And it's a negative incentive, if I can use that, negative incentive for businesses to locate in Flint. Well, let me give you this example. I live in the Sixth Ward. In the Sixth Ward, it is hard to get different types of services. I do not believe we have one laundry mat in the Sixth Ward. And I would ask yourselves, how many laundry mats, other council members, are in your ward? We may have one gas station in the Sixth Ward. There's something wrong with our community when the residents, those who live in this community, cannot even partake or have services made available to them, and we have to leave our community for these services. And I would say, I would argue that one of the reasons is because of the level of taxation. With our high water rates, do you think a company will move into the city of Flint and open a laundromat? Or do you think they'll just go across the street in certain areas of our community and go into Mount Morris Township, Flint Township, the city of Burton, where those costs are less? where the cost to their employees is less because they do not have to pay an income tax if they live outside the city. Think about the number of funeral homes that are left in Flint. Flint, the vehicle city, we have only one, one new car dealership within our city limits. Something is drastically wrong. I would say, you know, certainly crime's an issue, um, but I believe the taxation is a problem. Look at the cost of our water, the Genesee Towers, the police millage that was just passed, the street light millage. I'll, I'll call these all millage, some are referred to as fees. The garbage millage. Now keep in mind that garbage millage was on time spread out across the entire community, whether you had a business or if, whether you were a business or uh, Residents, residential uh, structure, building, you were all taxed. Now the businesses did not get a benefit from that because they could not put their trash out. But likewise, you know, often we pay taxes even though we may not use something. We may not use our parks, we may not use the library, but we pay the taxes. So when they move that garbage millage to a fee onto the residents, the residents basically took up more of the cost of collecting garbage. I'm against the uh, privatization of our uh, garbage collection. Let me give you an example of what just happened in Genesee County. Flushing Township decided to, let me say, privatize or go with the county sheriff's department. There was a lawsuit, the police officers won, They'll be awarded back pay, and that's good, because they were done wrong. But more importantly, Flushing Township sold their police vehicles and a lot of equipment. And now they'll probably have to repurchase that stuff. And what it does is it backs a community into a corner. If we sell our trash, uh, our garbage trucks, what will we do one day when we need to come back and collect our own trash? Um, there was some talk this evening with council members about raising revenue. The Genesee Towers, or not the Genesee Towers, the uh, Rutherford parking deck. We spend millions on that, backing those bonds. I had said I was against parking meters in downtown Flint, but as long as you have to have parking meters, I argued that we should control that revenue. We should have our police force enforcing those parking meters. But no, we gave that up to the Downtown Development Authority. So council on one hand says, we'll give up this income benefit to the city, to the Downtown Development Authority, and now tonight we're looking for ways to raise revenue. I'm not sure what our city will do as we enter these crossroads, but it's, it's unfortunate. 
The people cannot afford higher taxes. We see that at the border review. We see that in services that they need from the city. It's unfortunate. Think about the people you represent. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Gregory Eason. Mr. Eason. <clears throat> Good evening, Greg. Good evening, Council. Um, I had stated uh, when I was here last time that I'm going to be at every city council meeting and I'm going to continue to raise some issues. The reason why I'm going to continue to raise issues is because for one whole year, I virtually have been quiet. You haven't heard from me, I haven't said one word. Let me repeat what I said before, because I think it's important. I really did have high hopes that by bringing an emergency manager to the city of Flint, working with city council, that what would come out of that <clears throat> was that hopefully we would be able to find our way to becoming solvent. Even though I had my doubts about that, I kept my mouth shut because I wanted the process to at least have a chance. But I'm disturbed by something. Because over the course of the whole last year that I have been quiet, I think this community has been misled. Let me just talk about how they've been misled. I'm here to tell you something, and I hope that somebody remembers what I said three years from now. The deficit problem that we have today, which was a deficit problem that we had one year ago, we are not going to solve our deficit problem three years from now. What you're going to end up having is you're going to have an emergency manager that's going to make almost three quarters of a billion of a million dollars. You're going to have, I'm sorry, a city administrator who's going to make almost three quarters of a million dollars. You're going to have an emergency manager who is completely removed from those people who are being negatively affected by all of these changes that are being made. I intentionally went to a neighborhood association meeting, which was the college cultural because I wanted to hear the city administrator answer some questions. He wasn't here at the last city council meeting, so I went to a meeting that I knew he was going to be present. <clears throat> and I asked the question, how is it during the course of a five-year period where you're going to generate somewhere between maybe 20 to $25 million dollars How is it that in year one, because of the millage, you're going to generate about $5.3 million in revenues? And yet still, he's only talking about 10 police officers, not in one year, but over a period of the next three or four years. So in essence, here's what this means. It does not we're not paying $100,000 a year for a police officer. So when he said that, I know he was not telling the truth. But I didn't say anything because I wanted to see how much was he going to continue to lie. So the question came up to the city administrator. So you're going to collect $5.3 million in year one. And let's use hypothetically the number of $100,000 a police officer. Ten police officers would amount to one million dollars. So how in the world are you going to collect 5.3 million dollars in just millage money and yet still you're only going to commit less than a million dollars to police officers? Here's the reason why. Because the millage had nothing to do with public safety at all. What this is about is a city administrator and an emergency manager who's willing to lie to the public 
overtax the public, impose taxes on people who cannot afford to pay it. Forget about those individuals who are economically distressed on the north end of Flint, those who are economically distressed on the east end of Flint, those who are economically distressed on the south end of Flint, those who are economically distressed on the west side of Flint. This has nothing to do with public safety. What this has to do with is a city administrator and an emergency manager who is willing on, on, uh, at your expense to lie to you has nothing to do with protecting you whatsoever. Could you just give me two more minutes, please? Has nothing to do with protecting you whatsoever. This is about balancing a budget. This is about balancing a budget, but we still will not resolve this issue with the deficit. And that is the reason why I thought it was most appropriate when, when the councilman, Josh Freeman, asked a question. Give me something specific. When are we going to reach an end with this deficit issue? The fact of the matter is the finance director could not give him a straightforward answer because there is no straightforward answer. This has nothing to do with public safety. Those water and sewer rates which they increased, all the thing they're going to end up doing is disenfranchising the city of Flint. What's going to happen is those poor people who are supposed to be protected on all sides of this community will not get protected. There is no intent whatsoever on protecting people. They're willing to do this at expense. And by the way, let me just say this much to you. The thing that I find that's most appalling is Mike Brown don't live in the city of Flint. So he don't have to pay these high sewer rates and water rates. He doesn't have to worry about paying all of these taxes. What he does is he collects our money, then he goes to Lansing and he spends his money in Lansing. He doesn't have to live with the fallout of what's happening in our community. And I'm going to tell you something. I am not going to stop Mike Brown and Ed Kurtz because I think it is very disingenuous on your part. First of all, to lie to the community. You have not been honest. And I want you, for those people in the community, and for Scott, I'm going to wrap this up. But I think it's important when I say right. this. I'm going to do this in one minute. Okay. For the great grandmamas and the grandmamas and the aunties and the uncles and the aunts that's on the north end of the Flint, south end of Flint, west end of Flint, south end of Flint, mm -hmm. east end of Flint, for all of you, I want you to understand something. These people have lied to you. They're not being honest with you. They're not being honest. It is your children who are going to continue to die. It is your children who's going to continue to have their lives being threatened. There is no intent. They lied to you about doing this millage. And Mike Brown and Ed Kurtz, I am not going to rest until you start being honest with this community. Let me close. Two years from now, three years from now, we're still going to have a deficit problem. They are not going to solve the deficit problem. But what's going to happen is they're going to use you. Your children are going to be in jeopardy. Your lives are going to be in jeopardy. Mark my words. Three years from now, the deficit problem that we have to this day, we're going to have that deficit problem then. But what would, what would, what would be different? Greg. I need you to sum up, please. Is that the emergency manager will make three quarters of a million dollars. That's what will be different. I'm not going to stop city council. I'm going to come here every city council meeting, and I'm going to continue this message because Ed Kurtz, you've lied, and Mike Brown, you've lied. Thank you. OK, Madam Clerk, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Carolyn Shannon. Ms. Shannon. <clears throat> to the Honorable President Scott Kincaid and to the Honorable Council and to the very Honorable Inez Brown, City Clerk. I'm very glad to be here today 
but I'm here to fight for my city. And I think as individuals, we all need to fight for the city that we love. We have our future here today. And I want them to see what we can do as citizens of Flint. Um, I heard about something about outsourcing. Outsourcing any job in this city is a negative. You mean to tell me you will allow some dictators to come in here and say, the garbage people, their jobs will go somewhere else. Okay, if they go somewhere else, who is going to pay their taxes? Who is going to pay their water bills? Who is going to buy food for them? We need every job we can get in the city of Flint. And anybody that threatens the way we live need to be out. I have requested that Governor Snyder come and see what we want for our city. And what we do not want is some vintage people coming in here that have retired multiple times running our city. We want people that love this city, that live here. We want to be able to walk down the streets in the daytime. We want to see the children riding their bicycles in the daytime. We want to see the ice cream man. We do not want a city that is unprotected. We do not want to fill our city with managers that do not live here, that do not have the heart and soul of Flint. What is for our future? if you outsource the jobs? What is our future if you don't pay the people that live here? I am very upset because I've been on this journey a very long time. I was a John F. Kennedy girl. I know what a democracy is. This is not a democracy when someone can come into your city and already establish municipality and take over, fill their pockets up with your money and walk away in a couple of years. And as Mr. Mays has already said, I don't care what you think about Mr. Mays, but a lot of times, and most of the times, he's right. He's just a wave maker. But Mr. Easton was right. These people have no intentions of getting rid of uh, leaving here to about another 18 months. I don't want them in this city 18 minutes. We need to find a legal way to get rid of the emergency managers. They're not going to come and sit in here and answer any questions because that would eliminate their jobs. But it's your grandmother, your grandfather, your children that is going without. It is Dane Wallen's children that is going without. $55,000, that's, that's a slap in the face. What is, he, what is he still mayor for? Is he a ribbon cutter? Breaking ground? We need a mayor in this city. And I asked the professor at the University of Michigan, I said, do we have any intelligent people to run our city? And he said, yes. And I believe it. I believed it then, and I believe it now. And you also have to love this city. These people don't love Flint. They're cutting our throats every turn that they can and smiling about it. All I'm saying is get rid of these. I'm going to fire the emergency managers right now. 
The emergency managers are, fi are fired as of today. They are meaningless to the city of Flint. We need to run our own city because why? We love it. We understand it. We understand the people. And you know what? The people of Flint made me who I am today. And I love them for it. And I go to all the churches. I don't care if they're Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic. I have people in all of them. And I love my people. And I love the city of Flint. And I want, we, I want us to control it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Okay, our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is Mr. Brent Turner, I believe. Mr. Mr. Turner? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, council people. I'm not very elegant with speech. I'm just a senior citizen who has a very hard complaint. Um, I'm only speaking not only for myself, but for various uh, senior citizens who are being faced with a corporation that is inside the city who says, Whatever they say, go. I'm not here to cry on your shoulders, but I'm here to see if anybody in this city can tell, can tell me how do you take on a corporation who tells you it costs you a certain <coughs> thing to have their service. You pay it. The middle women, you're 63 years old, have COPD, and they say 12 hours later, guess what? Can't, you can't, uh, what, uh, Power don't come on. Now, I waited a whole month for pay because I knew I owed them. Then when I paid them, then when I paid them, they sent me to a cold house. I go to the cold house. I called them. I called them on numerous occasions. What do I get? A tape recording. Okay? Leave a number. Leave a name. Okay? Then, hey, I will not, will not lie. I didn't know it was against the law. I didn't pay you what I owed you. You told me you're going to turn it on. I waited 12 hours. You're going to turn it on. I'm not going to sit there and freeze it after you got my money, making more money off of it. So I cut it back on. Now they tell me I owe more money because I cut it back on. Who in the world can you ever face when they tell you they're taking a tax break and everything else? And then they tell you, guess what? What we tell you, go. Ain't nobody more powerful for than us. There's a man upstairs who'll handle it all. But right now, I need to handle down here on earth. OK? I'm not crying just for myself. I'm crying for every seat. When, they, when, when an individual from a company tells you, you're going to pay us because guess what? We got lawyers, and the area you live in is too poor to have lawyers, for you to afford a lawyer. All I want to know is if anybody, blind, crippled, crazy, or whatever, has any knowledge of where I can get some help, where I can get some help, so that I can spread the word to other senior citizens and other people who are living in this, who's living in this city, who are being told, I will charge you what I want. I will turn it on when I want, and you put it on my property and tell me I cannot turn it on when I paid you and you're still using my money. That's all I got to say. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much, Scott. Councilman Freeman. I think he's talking about a problem with Consumers Energy, is that right? That's correct. If you've got a complaint against Consumers Energy, the governing body that oversees them is the Michigan Public Service Commission, and I would call them. They should be in the phone book. Um, I don't have a number right here, um, but they would be the person that you would uh, lodge a complaint against or start that process with is the Michigan Public Service Commission out of Lansing. Yep. M MPSC. Thank you, Councilman Freeman. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is Quincy Murphy. Quincy Murphy. <coughs> Mr. Murphy. He's coming. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Um, I came to you two weeks ago about um, some th projects that we was doing in the community. But before I get started, I want to know, if we, can we have a 10-second um, moment of silence for my friend Rick 
Scott, he got, um, he was in a um, car accident and passed away today on the corner of Baltimore and Martin Luther King, I believe. Thank you. Um, I didn't know they was doing the audit report today, but um, just listening to the audit report, um, it's very sad that the city of Flint is in a situation that it is in. And um, I remember last year when this um, millage was um, coming through, I was against this millage for the um, police because I felt that it was gonna end up somewhere else. And I um, presented you guys with a um, millage amendment, but it was too late to see if we can earmark a portion of that $5.2 million for um, crime prevention activities for the community to um, utilize for school people like Burston Field House and Haskell Brain that offer activities and recreational activities for youth. And it will be a sad day to see that the voters voted for a millage that's gonna be um, redirected for covering the deficit. So I will hope that the council look at other ways in trying to put a, um, I don't know how to say this, but an amendment or restricted um, funds on those, that millage dollars to where those dollars don't be going nowhere else besides police. And we hire more than 10 police officers and not in three or four years, but in the first year, being that the crime is high in the city of Flint. But if that's not the case, I would um, like for you guys to um, consider utilizing those dollars that they're going to be utilizing for covering the deficit to um, utilize and put it in restricted funds to um, help um, programs to um, help you in the neighborhood and do some employment opportunities. Because we would hate to have to them pay millage dollars for funds to cover somebody else's mistakes. And if that's what the 5.2 um, police millers um, is here for, I will ask that you guys subpoena um, the pastor over there at, um, um, if it's, what is it called? Pastor Stokes. Pastor Stokes, excuse me, thank you. Pastor Stokes, um, subpoena him and you know, everybody else who campaigned for this police millers so that we can ask them questions on why aren't we getting more than 10 police officers for $5.2 million, and is these funds gonna be strictly for what they campaign and convince residents who voted for this that they were gonna be for? Because don't look like it's going there. And um, it's just very unfortunate. I've been coming to city council meetings since Johnny Tucker, and it's very unfortunate that we in this situation today to where we even, in the um, emergency manager. I remember when Greg Eason, the um, former city administrator, and Dan Wallen came and um, they submitted a um, $20 million, um, they requested a $20 million bond from the state to cover the deficit, but they only got 8.5, if I'm not mistaken, and it still didn't cover the deficit, and here we is. Um, became in a deficit 8.5 and now we what, 18? Th this is just sad. And we not benefiting off of anything that's happening that's taking place in the downstairs in the city administrator or the city of Flint. And we, people like me, we trying to stay focused, stay solution driven, but it just get so heartbreaking to come down here week after week after week and listen to all of this. It's just like, I, under, I see why people don't vote, and I see why people don't come here, because we get the same results, and we tired of the same results. So on that behalf, I'm um, inviting you guys to come out to Bethlehem Temple Church this Friday from 4.30 to 6.30, and we're going to come up with some solutions to um, bringing our city back. We're going to stay focused. We're going to stay solution-driven. I'm not here to bash nobody, but we all need to be working together to see how we can solve this problem together. Because it ain't just y'all problem. It's our problem, too. And we got to work together to make it happen. So here's a copy of the um, flyer. I want to give it to you guys. and um, Y'all more than welcome to come out. And if y'all not, y'all can put me on the agenda and I can do a presentation at the next city council or whenever you guys would like for me to come back down here. Thank you. <coughs> Quincy, just leave it on the table and we'll make copies for everybody. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker, Our next speaker is Mr. A.C. Dumas.
Good evening, AC. Good evening. My name is AC Dumas. I am a resident of the city of Flint. And I just want to say that uh, I was here for the uh, budget. Number one, you can't borrow your way out of debt. That's rule number one. No one has ever borrowed their way out of debt because when you borrow some money, you're in debt and you've got to pay it. Under this new, I don't know what you call it, law that they're proposing, emergency financial, the new one's coming up. It gives four options, I think. And one of them is a consent agreement, emergency manager, and bankruptcy is one of them, I think. I think the city of Flint ought to consider bankruptcy. Number one, you're protected by the federal courts. I think that's an option. I'm like Mr. Eason. You got $19 million in debt now. And you say you got a balanced budget. Well, you really don't have a balanced budget. You're really $19 million still in debt. You don't believe me? Get your property, your home or something, and you owe back taxes. You can pay all the current tax you want. Your house is going over, over in land bank. And it's no longer your home. They're going to put a forfeiture sign and all like that, and you lose your home. If you don't believe me, I, I, I'm pretty sure most of you saw the Flint Journal the other day. That thick. And most of those properties were in the city of Flint. A lot of those properties were people that couldn't afford their taxes. So subsequently, it's over in land bank. So, you know, I don't know how this hash out, but certainly, if this council has anything, I would uh, consider filing bankruptcy. Well, General Motors did it. General Motors filed. A lot of corporations filed. You know, file bankruptcy. Get a fresh start. That's why it was created. African Americans never used it. Other folk used it. And they saved their houses up north and everything else. File bankruptcy. Don't that sound like a good idea? You think you're going to pay your way out of $19 million? Well, it's going to be $25 million. And the rich will get richer, and the poor will get and stay poor. And also, as I go to my seat, we have to do something about this time limit. We've got to do something about, you know, Madam Clerk usually give you five minutes grace to get your slip in, you know. But we just, I mean, it's very annoying to, to people come in a half hour late, send the slip up there, you know, come on time or have somebody sign your name. And that clues me too also. I think we ought to increase the time limits to seven millions, uh, Mr. President. When seven million, uh, minutes is up, turn off the mic. Turn off the mic. Because, you know, people take advantage of your kindness. Or 10 minutes, turn off the mic, I think seven minutes then we won't have to keep on going through this. You know, going through this. Seven minutes, cut off the mic. If they can't say, write, their, write it down like I do. I'm gonna give you some change back. Thank you, AC. <clears throat> Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our final speaker is Alex Harris. Five minutes, Eric. <laughs> if I wasn't such an insensitive guy, I'd take that personally. Come on. But Alex. I won't. And I used to joke that uh, a city council meeting is about as much fun as a root canal. Well, a couple hours ago, or about four hours ago, I finished with a root canal. I'm happy to say city council being comes out a little better. Anyway, uh, 
I couldn't help. I didn't intend to speak, AC. I really didn't. Uh, but uh, I was just, th this tax issue, when I hear Mr. Ambrose drone on, as I've heard him drone on before, that the city, you know, can't cut its way out of its problems. And really, I see that as an inference that we need to create revenue. And what do they mean by create revenue? They mean tax. <clears throat> they, they have euphemisms like user fees and special assessment. How, how much was that special assessment for Genesee Towers? I paid a fortune, well, my wife and I paid a fortune just helping facilitate that, you know, mastermind that financial agreement for a dollar with uh, Uptown. Anyway, I was just looking over, you know, made a few notes. Water rates, over 110% increase in the last two years. I think the first one went down just about this time two years ago, among the 30, 40, uh, 30, 25, 35%, three installment water rate increases. Property taxes. Just with the six mil public safety millage that we just passed, if my math is pretty good, and it usually is, we've increased our property tax rates over 40%. And we're, of course, at the cap. We can't, unless there's some special uh, referendum, we can't tax our citizens any further. We're at the maximum level on property taxes. Then income taxes. As Mr. Brown, in a meeting I attended in the last week, suggested, they're, they're seeking approval from the uh, state legislature, the state government, because that's how you have to do it, for an income tax uh, increase. And what are they asking for there? A 50% increase in income tax rates. We go from, if you're a resident, you go from 1% to 1.5%. If you're a non-resident working in the city, you go from half a percent to three quarters of a percent. Correct me, Mr. President, if I state uh, something uh, incorrectly. Fact of it is, ladies and gentlemen, these guys, and I, I think uh, Mr. Eason and Mr. Del Maroney, and forgive me, maybe a few other speakers uh, uh, touched on it. These guys are in here for a very short term. And they're going to squeeze as much blood out of the citizens, as much revenue, as much tax revenue as they can. Forget the repercussions, what it'll mean going forward. Mr. Del Maroney mentioning about business and how most businesses really operate on the peripheral of Flint, or many businesses do, because they don't want to be involved in Flint's ever spiraling out of control tax and, and spend rates. But the bottom line is, these people that are here are here for a short time. They're going to get as much revenue as possible. It's going to be incredibly counterproductive for the growth of this city going forward after they leave. As we used to slay, say in crude terms about something else, it's slam bam, thank you ma'am. It really is. There's no other way of dressing it up. And Mr. Freeman, who's spoken on this before, as have others, but he's hit that again tonight, asking uh, uh, Mr. Ambrose about legacy cost. They continually, continually spiral out of control. They swallow up more of our budget more of our tax revenues, more of these special taxes that have been devised are paying for retiree benefits that do nothing, do absolutely nothing in a way of productivity for this city going forward. So ladies and gentlemen, those are simple facts. It's not opinion. It's not ideology. That's what this is all about. It's going to continue that way. And until the citizens seek another recourse or refuse to parlay and vote in these special tax rates, and I'm getting off the phone in a second.
Yeah, because you turned in your slip late, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll get already AC got on me. Now right. You don't have to pile on. But the bottom line is we won't get out of this mess as long as we play their game. They snookered us on the public safety. I believe Mr. Eason is absolutely correct. In fact, a fair amount of that money will be directed for retired police and fire and public safety officers. But we are just going to continue to pay the piper as long as they are in town. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> Okay, that concludes our speakers for this evening. We have a couple of resolutions um, that we need to act on. We need to set a public hearing date on resolution 130055 for the City of Flint uh, Parks Recreation Master Plan. Um, is there a motion for to set a public hearing? So moved. It's been moved. Is there support? Support. It's been moved and supported. Discussion? Roll, Madam Clerk. Hold a second, Mr. Case. I'm sorry? So just, for, just for the... This is to set a public hearing. Right. I wanted to make sure the public understood what we were doing uh, yep. in, in total. Uh, this resolution? The public hearing... You want, you want go to ahead, read no, it? No, go ahead. The resolution uh, is to set a public hearing on the City of Flint... Um, Parks and Recreation Master Plan to be held February 25th, 2013 at 5.30 p.m. here in the Council Chambers. And I believe a copy of the plan is on file, if I remember right. And there's it's in also the clerk's one, office. And there's one at the uh, Flint Public Library. Mr. President, if I could add to uh, the discussion, the uh, Megan Hunter, who is in charge of the master planning process, has asked to come to council uh, on February 11th to present to council the information and to the public regarding the master plan. Right. And she, she will also present on the 25th, but she's going to present twice. Okay. Just for informational purposes. Okay. So on February 11th, the uh, Megan will be here to talk about the City of Flint's master plan, and then on the 25th. Right. Is Pat Drace coming for the master plan for the parks? Only Megan, to my knowledge. Okay. 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 All right. So the resolution has been moved and supported. Discussion from council members? Roll, Madam Clerk. Ms. Kroom? Yes. Mr. Freeman? No. Mr. Neely? Yes. Mr. Sargentson? Yes. Mr. Kincaid? Yes. The motion fails. Okay. Four to one. Uh, I think there was a Mr. President, if I could uh, give a little bit of history for Mr. Freeman on this particular. Uh, clerk, I don't need any history. Okay. Um, they've asked for no input from the city council. Um, no one has called me to tell me that, uh, you know, we're, we're putting a master plan together for our parks. Um, you know, what do you think? Um, if they want to approve a master plan, let them hold the public hearing and approve a master plan. I, they don't need to come before this body and give input to this body who's got no input into the master plan for the park. So, no, I, that, that's why I wanted to give you a little bit of history as well as to the audience. I appreciate that, but there's no need on my part if, if you want to give it to well, somebody. Well, if I else, could give it great. to the audience or to the rest I, of the I, I would like to hear Ms. Okay. Mrs. Clerk. Ms. Hunter contacted our office regarding the master plan about a week ago, and there was some discussion as to whether or not um, it should be approved by the council or by the emergency manager. She made contact with the state of Michigan, and the state of Michigan indicated that it should be approved by both the council as well as the emergency manager. Because if, the, if this ever goes into effect, by the time it goes into the effect, the manager will be gone, and the council will still be here as the legislative body. Therefore, she put together a resolution. Mr. Kurtz, as the emergency manager, then referred the resolution to council for council to approve, thus the public hearing to have the public here 
exactly what's in the plan. So there was a lot of dialogue between the state, and I think to the credit of the state, they said we want council's approval. That's why the resolution is here. But the, but the motion has failed. Councilman Freeman has made a, a good point. The emergency manager has held public hearings in the Dome Auditorium before in the past, and the motion failed. And, so. you know, and not only that, but you know, how many um, ordinances that don't deal with finances had the emergency manager enacted? The state didn't step in and say that you know, these are non-financial uh, ordinances, and you know, they're going to be in effect after the uh, emergency manager is gone, and we'd like you know, the uh, concurrence of the city council. So. I mean, they, they speak out of both sides of their mouths. If they want to, I, I believe in consistency, Madam Clerk. I don't think the state is, I don't think the state is aware of some of the problems with the ordinances and we are accumulating those to bring it to the manager's atten I, attention. I, I appreciate that, but. They can, they can wait they can and bring the. Uh, bring that one too. Resolution back at some other point in time, so. Or the emergency manager can just enact it. That's right. Like he does every other resolution. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah, one one point to that. Yeah, um, just a side note. I know the motion has failed, and we won't have that uh, public hearing before the uh, public on February 25th. But I still would like to hear from Megan Hunter on February 11th if she could come and present uh, to this body. You know what's in that plan, uh, so the, the public will also have an opportunity to listen to what has been put together. Whether this body takes uh, a role in approving a public hearing or or the, uh, the master planning process, I still would like to hear it and do it in a public, in a public yeah. way. I, I think the February 11th, um, Sheldon, is just an update um, for us. I don't think the plan is completed and ready for a public hearing yet. I understand. I just, wh whatever yeah. Megan Hunter, uh, the master planner, uh, whatever she has for us and the request has been made to, right. uh, to come before us on February 11th, I would like that to be honored so, so we can hear whatever she brings forth. If it's right. a completed plan, or partial plan, I think we deserve an opportunity to hear it, and also the public does as well. And, and we can do a special order so we can get it done right up front. Yes. Thank you. So, okay. All right, uh, appointments, Madam Clerk. Recommendation for Board of Review for the second ward. Uh, second ward, council person has left. Um, well, just so that you'll know, Mr. President, uh, the previous appointee for that particular position, which was approved, uh, about three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, Carolyn Hawkins was unable to um, fulfill the requirements okay. well, because of personal reasons and uh, decided that she could not serve. Therefore, Ms. Poplar has selected uh, Robert Stamps, who is from her ward, to serve in Ms. Hawkins' stead. Okay. Is there a motion to approve Mr. Stamps to the Board of Review? It's been moved. Is there support? Support. Yeah. Okay, roll map discussion. Roll, Madam Clerk. Mr. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Daly? Yes. Mr. Sargentson? Yes. Mr. Kincaid? Yes. Mr. Ms. Croom? Yes. The vote is five yes, zero no. Okay. okay. That uh, concludes the um, um, Resolutions and appointments. Our next meeting is for 5.30 on February the 11th. Are there any council persons wishing to speak at this time? Yes. Councilman uh, Up on Councilman Lawler having to leave early, he asked me to make mention of, of something for him. Uh, last week, council members and some clergy members had a small meeting to talk about the element of crime in our community to come up with some effective resolutions on how that we can attack uh, the, the crime in our community, how we can come up with some solutions. Uh, Councilman, Vice President um, Nolden was there, L Lawler was there. I stood in your behalf because- I couldn't be there, right. You, uh, Council President Kincaid could not be there, so I, I filled in. And we also had a couple of members from the clergy, uh, Pastor Holmes and also Pastor Threlkel, to have a dialogue. Uh, those dialogues will continue, and once uh, some type of resolutions um, uh, can be determined, we will bring them forth uh, and, and put them for, before the public to see how we can implement this as a full community. I'm not for sure if I'll be in one of those meetings in the future, but 
Uh, I'm sure uh, Councilman Lawler will bring forth, or Nolan or Kincaid will bring forth those, solution, those solutions, excuse me, uh, that they come up with. I just, he just wanted me to make mention of that, and I wanted to do so, though. Thank, thank you, because I was planning on attending that meeting until the time changed, or until the time got changed uh, to 11 o'clock, and I just couldn't get away from my job, so. Any other, anyone else? I, I just want to make a comment. I did this last year, um, right after they did the audit presentation, and I projected what the deficit was going to be at June 30th, uh, 2012, and it come out a little bit higher than what I projected. We all heard the finance director say that we were going to have a balanced budget. I question that. I, I think they'll do whatever they can uh, to have a balanced budget, but I don't quite believe that the revenue is coming in as they projected, and I don't think that their expenditures are completely un under control when you look at some overtime in some of the areas of the city of Flint and you look at some of the other areas and departments um, where the expenditures are. If they come in with a balanced budget, there are going to be a lot more cuts in the city of Flint. So um, we've got two choices. There'll either be a deficit at the end of this year, small but deficit, or there's going to be substantial cuts because they've got six months to make up for the loss in expenditures from where they're spending the money. And you have to double your cuts in order to save that amount of money in a very short period of time. And for every month that we go on, those cuts have to become deeper and deeper and deeper. So they've got five months left. And uh, there are a number of areas in the city of Flint currently, when you look at the budget and you look at the projections, um, the expenditures are outpacing the revenue, and I think that they've overestimated some of the uh, property tax and income tax. So um, I, I said last year the deficit for the city of Flint was going to be $16 million. That's what I said. It's 19. I never seen a... Uh, a facility like the Genesee Towers get added to the deficit, so that was 1.5 million. But I, I, I just want everyone to know that um, my projections tonight are deeper cuts or a deficit, and I think they'll do whatever they can to prevent a deficit because they're here to eliminate them, not create them, at least now. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>